Hello. So in this video, we're going to see how we can use the Python programming language to generate an animation for Wikipedia. Now, what I would say, this is not a new animation. It's going to replace an existing animation on Wikipedia. If I go over to Wikipedia, for the Wikipedia page for the polarization of waves, if you scroll down, there's an animation under the polarization state which shows the four different polarizations of light. So it cycles between four different polarization states of light. You see it circles between right-hand circular polarized light, X polarized light, left-hand circular polarized light, Y polarized light, and then cycles all the way around back to right-hand circular. Now I created this GIF on Wikipedia in 2016, I do believe, 2016. And there's a few things that I don't like about it. So I've been wanting to redo this for a while now. So remake this animation for a while. And I thought now would be a good time to do so. There are a few things I don't like about this. It's quite pixelated. The colors don't look great. So the curve, for example, is in red. You get these little arrows, which are very pixelated and unclear, are in green. The two projections in the XY plane aren't very clear, again pixelated, and I don't like the font or the little box around it. So there's quite a lot of things I don't like about this. So I thought it would be a nice little exercise to go ahead and remake this using Python, and actually just make it a little, a little bit nicer. So when I originally did this, I actually made all of this in GNUplot. I don't have the original code, unfortunately. I think it might have been on one of my old work computers. So we just need to look at the existing GIF and see what we need to change. So I think we need to keep the same idea of cycling between four different polarization states. I think keeping four or five complete oscillations of the wave on the view at any one time is quite nice. We'll keep the X and Y projections. I think it'd be quite nice to add an X, Y prediction on the bottom. And I think moving this text to the top would be far better. And also just look at the information. It says it's 25 seconds long, 250 frames and 1.69 megabytes. I think Reducing this time slightly might be beneficial because at the minute it's quite choppy, so there's quite a lot of frame rate issue. And we'll try and aim for the same file size, but it doesn't matter if we maybe make it a bit bigger if the drawback of that is increased quality. And this 300, 300 by 600 pixels is probably a bit too big because the default image size on Wikipedia is 200 pixels wide. And there's also another caveat with animated GIFs that if the image contains more than 100 million pixels, so width times height times number of frames, then it will only show the first frame of the animation in a thumbnail. So we need to keep that down as well. Let's go ahead and try and remake this, but better in Python. So as normal, I'll be using Spider. So Spider's the ID that's packaged with Anaconda. It's quite nice, got a nice variable explorer. Probably the first one you'll use if you've just downloaded Anaconda as, say, an undergraduate physicist. The first thing we're going to want to do is import some useful packages. So NumPy, SciPy, uh, Essential, and Matplotlib. So we're plotting everything in Matplotlib because that makes publication quality plots. So typically Matplotlib is the plotting library used to create really high quality looking plots. And again, just to reiterate, this is what we're trying to achieve. We want axes labeled X, Y, and Z. We want a clear depiction of the wave in the middle. We want that to move upwards. We want to show the projection in both the X plane and the Y plane. And we want a clear label at the top of the image. Let's go ahead and change some default parameters. So this just makes all the text, all the font on the image 24 units high and changes the line width of the axes to three. I'll go ahead and create the nominal frame rate. This is the frame rate that we expect the video to run at. That's, let's lower that down a bit. 16 because when you make an animated gif you don't want the frame rate too high because the file size will balloon massively on something quite reasonable but we can always come back and change these parameters this bit of code here so if you look at the wikipedia article for jones vector it gives us a list of vectors which describe the polarization states of light so if you take a light wave with a electric field components times those by some complex amplitude you end up with something called the jones vector which describes how the two different orthogonal components, EX and EY, are related to each other through complex numbers. We go ahead and paste those in, paste that into a dictionary so we can actually track what the name of that polarization is, as well as the Jones vector. Now we're going to create some variables.
what to do all these mean if I just open Inkscape. So the first variable, number of states, is just how many different polarization states we'll be plotting. So y, right-hand circular, x, left-hand circular, that's four states. The number per period is if we zoomed in on a particular wave, how many points we're going to use to draw that at curves. So it's basically how many points per curve, but for just one period of the oscillation, whether that's x, y, right-hand or left-hand circular polarized. We're also going to have number of periods per state. So how many complete periods do you want to show for that particular state? So for example, five periods of Y polarized, five periods of right hand polarized, etc, etc. And the last one, number of periods per view is how many complete periods are we going to show in the view at any one time? And then we can also work out the number of periods, sorry, the number of points per view, which will just be the number of periods per view times the number of points per period. We'll go ahead and define a wave vector. So wave vector is just 2 pi divided by lambda. We know that lambda is the number of points per period. So we're plotting everything relative to that. We then want to go ahead and work out the total number required points. So you think that would be enough to describe what we need, but it's not. So one caveat of this is that in order for it to cycle back around in on itself, it has to be able to show its original state. So for example, if we started off here with one particular wave and transitioned to a circular polarization, and then to another one of these, and then another circular polarization, we then also need to be able to make sure we can cycle back to our original starting point. So we want the image to be looping, and we want it to be artifact free, so we want it to loop smoothly around. So in order to solve that, we have to add we have to add on another n points per view because that's how many view uh, that's how many points we can view at any one time. Go ahead and just print out how many frames will be in our animation. Let's go ahead and run that. So as with these current settings, we're going to have 479 frames in the animation, which doesn't sound too bad. The next thing we're going to need to do is to define our equation, so what we're actually plotting. So the equation is going to be exp. 1j az. We've got the k vector. We just need z. Go ahead and plot z just from 0 to n. Remembering n is the total number of points. And then go ahead and create two empty arrays. One for the polarization state. So that's going to be this name here. So what's the current state of polarization? The one is going to be the electric field. The electric field is going to have a, a type data type complex. It's going to be two columns, which will be the X component and Y component in each column. Polarization state is going to be an object type because it's simply going to be a string. We've got this variable here called n state, so that will tell us which states that we're currently in as we loop over this entire array n, you'll notice it's doing the integer division of i, which is going from 0 to n, with the number per period times the periods per state. So it's going to be the number of points required to plot that entire state. And then if we modulo that with n states, we'll get a number between 0 and 4, 4 not inclusive, so 0, 1, 2, 3, which tells us the current polarization state. And because n was extended by this n per view, we will see that at the end it will cycle around enough points in order to complete a full smooth animation. And then all we need to do is set the polarization state equal to that. So if I go ahead and run that using Spider's Variable Explorer, we can see that polarization state is now filled up. It's 0 to n, which remember we said n was 600, so n goes from 0 to 599. You see it starts off with y polarized light. We'll go to right hand, x polarized, left hand, and then back to y polarized in order to complete the looping animation. And that's the same order observed here. We then need to populate the electric field. And all we need to do is find the correct electric field from this states dictionary. Next thing we want to do is want to plot, we want to create the entire wave at one, in one go. So let's say XS, this will be the X component of the electric field. It'll be the first column of the electric field matrix times this complex exponential expression. 
as given by the Jones equation. We'll copy and paste that for the y expression, changing it to the second column. And so now we're pretty sure we've created what we want to create, but we just need to plot that to confirm. So let's go ahead and create a 3D plot. So at the top, I import this axis 3D from matplotlib toolkits. And to get the 3D, you just type in projection equals 3D. Go ahead and run that. It should just launch an empty plot, a 3D projection with the default axes. And then let's go ahead and plot this curve that we've just defined. So these X and Y coordinates we've just defined for the entire plot. And then we'll worry about moving it and animating it. And there we are, we can see our plot. So we can see that it goes from one polarization in the X direction to left hand circular polarized, sorry, Y direction to left hand to right hand circular polarized, the X direction to the left hand circular polarized, and then back to Y to complete the animation. This is perhaps not too clear because by default it set at the aspect ratio to one. So at the top, let's go ahead and add an aspect ratio. So it's an aspect ratio of three. The aspect ratio of the plot can then be changed using, using this command. So x.setbox aspect, one one aspect, so equal in the x and y, and then three times high in the z. That's a bit more clear, as you can see here. Y polarized right hand, x polarized left hand, y polarized. And this point here should match up perfectly with this point here. And what we need to do when we do the animation, we just need to take a certain small window of that plot and then move the entire curve through that window and only plot what's in that window. And we already know that at any one time, we only want to plot a certain amount of data within that window, which would be given by n periods per view times number per period, which in this case would lead to 120 points at any one time. So the next thing to do is let's add some labels because it wasn't very clear which polar which polarization we was at there. So I'm just going to create a little hash box so we can keep track of where we are. Call this plot setup. Call this data setup. Go ahead and plot that. See our X, Y, Z label, and then our curve in between. Let's go ahead and remove the ticks because those ticks don't look very nice and they don't actually portray any information for the animation we want. To do that, just type set X ticks and then give it an empty list. Do the same for Y and Z. There we go. You'll notice as well is that we have a problem here. So where it goes from the linear to the circular polarized light, we have a discontinuity because the phases didn't match up. The way I previously did this was I calculated the phase that this linear section would be by the time it reached the end of its cycle and made sure that a whole number of waves fit in that cycle or more specifically ended on a peak and then adjusted the phase of the second polarization state, so in this case, the circular polarization state so that it lined up perfectly. Now we're not going to do that here because I might want to adjust some of these parameters and it might not necessarily be a whole number of waves within the oscillation here. So a good way to fix that is let's just run a filter over it. So where we created our data, before we actually go ahead and use the E field, let's use SciPy because you know those discontinuities are literally over one pixel, so it's the, the highest possible frequency that can be represented within a data structure. If you use a Butterworth filter, you'll give it a second order Butterworth filter with a normalized cutter frequency of 0 0.1. So the way I like to imagine that is it will allow changes less than 10% of the overall data length to pass through. Anything above gets heavily attenuated, gets smoothed out. And then we apply a filt filt which will apply the filter in two directions so that it doesn't introduce any phase delay. It applies the filter half 
half the filter in one direction and then half again in the backwards direction. Now if you go ahead and plot that, we can see now we get smooth transitions from each of the polarization state to the next. There's no more discontinuity. Which is perfect. You can also play around with this value here. You'll see that higher values result in more of a sharp transition. See it here. Sharp. So now that we know it works, we can go ahead and set up our animation. So as normal, I'll be using the matplotlib animation func animation from the matplotlib library. And all it needs is it needs a function that tells it what is happening during the animation. I'll be update. I will not be using blitting on this particular animation because we will have a title, which means that we won't be able to successfully change the title if we are blitting, because that can return something empty. And then we tell it the function animation. So we've already got a figure that we created. We tell it function, which will which is called every time an animation is requested. Let's plot it at our nominal frame rate. And for frames, we're going to do something special. We're going to start from n minus n per view, minus 1. And we're going to go down to 0 in steps of minus 1. You'll see why momentarily. Let's not repeat it. And we're not going to be blitting. That's our animation set up. What we need to do now is just prepare the plot for an animation. So if you remember on the Wikipedia page, we want a curve in the middle. That shows the actual polarization. We want two curves for the X and Y projections. We're also going to add a third curve for the X, Y projection. And we're also going to add some arrows from the central line to the curve. What we do is we create a curve, but don't actually plot anything. And we'll set a line width manually here and apply that to our curve. So we've got an X curve, Y curve, X, Y curve. They'll all be the same color. We then got our curve in the middle, which we can go ahead and remove the data from. We'll have that as a default color, which should be blue. In fact, let's go ahead and put it. We also want an empty quiver plot. So these are arrows. Now, if I give it a quiver width, if I go ahead and plot that, it's not going to plot anything, which is good. Also give it a title, but again, not plot anything. It basically created a plot with four different curves, a vector plot called a quiver, and a title, all of which are empty. Now, in order to get the animation, it's really simple. So when we call our update function, it will send in this, so frames, which we've enumerated. So it will send in a tuple containing what the first item with the frame, the current frame that's been plotted, and then the variable called frame, which is whereabouts in the actual entire span of the data that we currently want to plot. Remembering that counts down from some large number to zero. So we're going to be going over the plot in a particular direction. We're going to tell it that if the title has changed by checking the polarization state of the frame, so if the title is not the same, so it's going to have changed, then we're going to go ahead and set it. Go ahead and put that because we should see this change at least as it's animated over. Good, it is changing. The minute we can't see anything because we've not told it to plot. Let's go ahead and just get the data we need. So let's just go ahead and create a private variable called X. And we're simply going to reference that XS, which was the data we already created from frame plus the frame plus N of you. It's as simple as that. And then we can go ahead and just set that data. Remembering to set data 3D because we're dealing with 3D plots. And that needs to be on the X plane. Let's set it at coordinate 2 and plot along Z. Also create our Z, which again will be similar, but Z can remain fixed. Z does not change because otherwise we'd just have a move, we'd be following a moving wave, so nothing would change. We need to keep Z the same 
and just move the wave itself in effect to where rolling basically the entire array, which might be a nice way to do it actually, to roll instead of doing this. You roll the single parameter. We do that, we see something's happening, but it's very strange. And there's a really good explanation for that, is that when we didn't plot anything here, when creating the curves, the default axes were used, which ends up being something like minus 0.04 to 0.04. So if we go ahead and actually manually set our X limits, so we're going to set them from minus limb to limb, minus limb to limb on the X and Y, and the Z is going to go for zero to this Z of N per view. And then let's go ahead and put in our limb. So limb can equal, let's say 1.5. Go ahead and plot that. This is now a lot more sensible. It's exactly what we want. We can see it's changing the polarization state, the titles being changed, and this projection is successfully moving. Let's go ahead and add in the code for the rest of it. The other two plots for the other curves. Remembering to change the appropriate parameters. do something a bit special for the XY projection on the bottom because we don't want it plotting say five full periods worth of line at once. We actually only want to see a single period. And last but not least, we plot the actual curve itself. So the three dimensional curve in the middle, go ahead and play that. And there we go. We get exactly what we want. animation is almost complete the last thing you need to do is just sort out these quivers quivers is a bit different so we have to do quiver set segments and then we need to add in a list of segments where each list says where the arrows go to and from we'll use a list comprehension we need to go over all the possible frames from now until the number of frames per view and then what we need to do is we need to create an array it needs to be a two-dimensional array where the first three elements will be the start position and the next three elements will be the end position of each quiver. And that should simply be this expression. Hopefully that's all typed in right. Go ahead and run it. You can see we get our little arrows going from the middle line to the curve as it goes through. So now our animation is complete. What we can do now is let's go ahead and save it. Inside the folder where this is kept, I have a, another folder called frames. If we go ahead and add a command in here, so every time we plot a frame in the output, we save it. So fig.savefig in frames, and it's going, this command here is going to create files called frames, something.png, with that something being a number four digits wide, forward padded with zeros. Go ahead and run that. You can see it's starting to create frames in this frames folder. Let's click through. You can see it's creating each frame of our animation. We can quite comfortably click through. What we'll do is we'll wait until all that is finished. Meaning that we have 479 frames in the output. And we know when it's finished because we've told the animation not to repeat. So this is now finished. We look in our folder, we do indeed have 479 frames. I get zero going up to 478. If I look at the first frame, the second frame, compare them, they are indeed exactly one cycle, one frame in our animation apart, so it should cycle nicely. Good. Let's go ahead and close that down. What we can do now is in the folder where we have our script we can create a batch file called makeamovie.bat in which all i do here is i use ffmpeg to create a movie from the frames so i read in the frames at 16 frames per second i scale them down i reduce the frame rate to eight frames a second so it's basically dropping every other frame and that just helps reducing file size because remember i want the file size to be similar to the original file size of 1.7 megabytes 
I crop it down. So if you go into the frame and look at it, you'll see that there's space on the left, bottom and right. All you have to do is open, say, Photoshop and just measure the minimum space required in order to represent this image. Not cropping it, you don't actually increase the file size too much because all this background is white and animated GIFs are quite intelligent at not adding in too much more information. We also scale it. So again, I didn't like the previous version on Wikipedia because it wasn't really the standard 200 pixels wide. So I tell it to be 200 pixels wide and then tell it to adjust the height as necessarily with the exception that the height will be ensured to be divisible by two. So this minus two for the scale is actually quite a nice little feature of FFmpeg. I then use the command palette gen and palette U, so it creates a palette of colors and then uses that palette of colors to create a high quality animated GIF. I then also copied the same command, but included an option called palette gen equals max colors equals 48. So rather than use the full 256 color palette, it uses a color palette of 48, which reduces the file size, but doesn't make the GIF look any different. I'll go ahead and execute this. And you'll see in the folder, it creates two files, one called polarization and one called polarization optim, so optimized. And we see the optimized version is 1.98 megabytes and the normal version is 2.9. So let's have a look. So that's the version we just created, a full copy version, full resolution version. And this is our optimized version. You see that even using reduced amount of colors at 48, it still maintains pretty much the same look. And it's smooth, and you see that when it gets to the end of its cycle, which should be coming up shortly, there is a smooth transition between the two. Oh yeah, lovely smooth transition. So that's that portion done. And then the next thing we need to do is just go ahead and upload it to Wikipedia. I think one last thing to know about this is, I go back to the uh, beginning of the video where Wikipedia said that um, if you have an animated GIF with over 100 million pixels, the width, time, height, time frames. They would not display credits in the thumbnail if you work this out. So it's 200 pixels wide by 404 pixels tall with 240 frames. That comes out to 19,392,000 pixels. It's well below the 100 million pixel limit. And there we are. We can see that the new file has been uploaded. We go ahead back to our original page where it was located. Probably need to clear the cache. And there we see. Clearing the cache. We now have our new GIF on Wikipedia, which I think looks a lot better than the old one. So yeah, so as I say, I've been wanting to do this for ages, finally got around to doing it. I hope you might have had an enjoyable experience watching how it was done and maybe inspire some of you to actually do this yourself. So I tend to put these GIFs on Wikipedia when I realise that there are pages without decent animations where an animation would actually explain a lot. So particularly pages which discuss time-based phenomenons and then don't actually have any, any animations describing it. It seems a bit odd to me. Because how can you understand something that changes in time if you can't actually see it change in time? So if you don't actually add the time dimension. So thanks a lot for watching.